Hey everyone, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling and thank you so much for joining me. Now today I'm speaking to Australian guitarist Brian Canham, the founding member, frontman and of course guitarist from a huge chart topping band Pseudo Echo. Now, whilst Brian is a bona fide pop star with the ARIA Awards to back it up, he is also a killer guitar player. In fact, in 1986, he unleashed the shred on Pseudo Echo's incendiary version of Funky Town with fantastic guitar all over that track that certainly knocked my socks off. Of course, when you dig back through the records and through post releases, there's great guitar throughout the Pseudo Echo canon, and it was very cool to meet Brian and talk all about it today. This episode is brought to you by The Pedal Movie, a feature length film all about effects pedals created by the Music Gear Marketplace Reverb. I am super excited about this film. The Pedal Movie features nearly 100 interviews with people like Steve Vai, Peter Frampton, Jay Mascus, Billy Corgan, and more, including some of our Guitar Speak podcast alumni like Dweezil Zappa, Sarah Lipstate, Johnny Barmer, and Brian Wampler. Reverb's The Pedal Movie is available now on iTunes, Google Play, and Vudu. For more information, visit www.thepedalmovie.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott. Now, Joe is not only a fantastic guitar player, he draws on his years of experience as the ex-head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology and also at the McNally Smith Music College. Here's a few words from Joe about the course. If you're tired of wading through hundreds of random guitar videos and just want to become a better player, Fretboard Biology is your answer. Fretboard Biology is a self-paced, college-level program that will give you the right instruction, in the right amounts, and in the right order. You'll learn the same information I taught to thousands of other guitar players over 30 years of teaching in top music colleges. If you want to make real progress with your guitar playing, then sign up for a free 7-day trial at fretboardbiology.com. Brian Cannon, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you. Pleasure. Great to have you. Brian, congratulations on your the new Pseudo Echo album, uh, 1990, The Lost Demos. Now, these are an old, this is a new record, but an old record. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, um, well I'll, I'll try and compact it. Well, I don't really need to compact it, do I? But I'll, I'll give you a breakdown. Yep. Um, 1988, we delivered an album called Race. That was our third album, Pseudos. And um, it, it was a bit of a quantum leap direction-wise. Um, we hopped straight into that big arena guitar rock sound from our electro sound. So it was a, it was a bit of a jump. And there was probably a, a big story about how it got to that stage, but that's another thing. So off the back of that, we were kind of thinking, look, you know, this might be it now because that album didn't fare so well for us, um, purely just because it was a big stylistic change. I think had we come out with that sound initially and that was our sound it may have been a different story sure. but as it was uh, it, it was it was a shock to the system that's for sure and um so we were thinking about you know personally for me i was thinking about how do i bring this back around how do i how do i fill in the gap that should have been between the love and adventure album our second album and the race album so i'd started writing material and um we had a call one day to come in and have a, a talk about the future and what we were going to do with the fourth album. And to my surprise, the band pretty much abandoned me and split up <laughs> in that meeting and all went off in different directions with different ideas of what they wanted to do. So I was left with pretty much a whole album that was intended for pseudos. And um, then all of a sudden the interest shifted to me as a solo artist and said, okay, let's hear this stuff. We, 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 you know, they'd been hearing bits of it. They said, we need it all together because everyone's chomping at the bit to hear it and they want a piece of it. So I hastily did my one and only master tape, dubbed off all my songs, rushed into the office and gave it to them and said, listen, this is my only copy. Can you guys duplicate it for me? And, um, you know, and then, I'll, then at least I'll have one backup. Um, I did that and then... I pretty much never saw the tape again. It just just didn't come back. You know, things get lost in offices and mayhem and, you know, who knows where it ended up, but it didn't get 
found ever again. So I basically threw the towel in and kind of gave up. I, I just I just got out of music altogether. I I must say I'd had enough of the limelight. That was for sure because I, I was at the top of the peak of our fame by that stage, and it was starting to get a bit invasive in my personal life and everything. So I kind of welcomed it in some respects. I thought, well, this is a sign. And I got straight into production, which I, I had a, a fruitful career in. And um, But it wasn't until like 30 years later that, you know, over the, over the next few decades, there'd been talk of this record, but I'd always said, you know, it's gone. It was lost. It was never found again. I, I, can't, I haven't got the songs in any other form. Um, I had bits of the lyrics. I had bits of the melodies, bits of the chords in my head, and that was it. And um, it was my wife, Raquel, who, who uh, incidentally manages pseudos. She, she sort of, every time she'd hear me play a little passage or a, or a section of one of those songs, she'd always pick her ear up and say, what's that song? Is, is, you know, you've got to find these songs. Is that one of the ones? And I say, yeah, yeah, that's it. And um, so she coerced me into kind of going through the archives again, and she found a box, and she said, what about that big box of tapes we found? And so I had to buy a tape deck and, you know, spend the next few weeks as it's slow going, you know, it's very slow going through analogue tape. It's not like you can just jump to a point here and there. You've got to fast forward, rewind. It's tedious and you've got to be careful too with the tapes. And yeah, yeah. So I love that you had to buy a tape deck. That's a classic. Uh... Oh, God. And it was a vintage deck. To... Yeah, yeah, that's right. A beautiful vintage um, Pioneer deck. It was the nice. one my dad had when I was a kid, so oh, wow. it was quite nostalgic buying it and yeah. playing the tapes on those again. I bought a power amp and a tuner and I said, just like my dad had when I was a kid, I bought the whole system so and set cool. it up. <laughs> Sounded so cool. <laughs> and um, But, um, yeah, after about a week of playing through stuff, I just couldn't believe it. One day I just heard one of the songs off that album and I had, had no idea they existed. I just thought I'd never find them. So it was like finding a long lost relative. I was freaking out. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Raquel came into the room. She was freaking out. We're both going, what the hell? And then I fast forward and here's the next song and here's the next song. And, and then Raquel sort of going, you've got to release this. And I'm saying, but it's, it's just a demo, darling. You know, it's not not finished really. I, I, it was close to finished, you know, like it's a high high production for a demo, I guess, back in the day. But um, on today's standards, I felt that I'd probably need to redo it. And I knew that would be a massive task. Like it was a lot of work and a lot of production. And um, meanwhile, we were chatting away. The tape had been rewinding on auto rewind. It got to the end and it was rewinding. And then I looked at it and I saw one spool wasn't rewinding and the other one was furiously rewinding. And I just said, oh, my God. And I just (laughs) hit the stop button and eject the tape. And there's that tape is just ingested into the machine, right? So 30 years goes by, we find this tape and then it gets eaten up by the tape machine. Oh, God, I should have cleaned the heads in. <laughs> like I didn't even service the machine. Oh, so, you know, yeah. keen to get into it. But anyway, we managed to get the tape out. We, you know, painstakingly just threaded it out, you know, inch by inch till we got it out. Um, you know, used the pens, yes. the pen yep. method yep. and scrolled it Classic back into method. the set, you know. <laughs> And um, yeah, it was it was gold. So we got oh, it back man. in, and we it was unbelievable. No creases, no nothing. And so I just said, right, this is being digitized professionally straight away. And um, and then we just said, look, it's meant to be. You know, we found it. It's here. It's still in one piece. Let's digitize it. And I said, okay, I'm going to release it as is, warts and all. Um, it, you know, it's more significant to release it as it is because it's yeah, a time capsule. Yeah. It's it's untouched from eighty nine ninety all the synths, the guitar sounds, the techniques, everything. So uh, that's that what is it is. Awesome. Now, now, you say you know, these were just demos, but, man, these are really elaborate demos. You've, you've overdubbed. There are hooks. <laughs> there are solos. There are backing vocals. Yeah, yeah. Doubled yeah. guitar. There's heaps of stuff going on. Yeah, it, it's a kind of a roadmap, you know, like you just – I would have taken that into the studio and then some things I would have probably bounced directly on. Okay, the multi okay, yep. and some things I would have replaced. Yeah. All but right. I would have used it as a map, you know. Yeah, sure. And um, so yeah, luckily it was a pretty good map. Was that always your process for pseudo echo? Would you write such elaborate demos? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, occasionally there were some that were a little bit rougher, but most of the time they were highly produced. They were like when we did Funky Town, I remember producing that at home on our studio and, and we took it into the studio and we, we almost just said, look, I want it to sound exactly like that. So we kind of fed the multi-track onto the other multi-track and ran it through the same process 
So basically the bass and some of the drums and everything came off the 12 track multi-track and went onto the 24 track. Wow. Yes. They were just transferred. I think I just redid the guitar and vocal. Okay. Awesome. So I guess you weren't, um, you weren't suffering what some people call demo-itis when you're trying to reproduce the demo. You're actually using oh, some of those parts. <laughs> oh, that's the worst thing, demo-itis. It's <laughs> horrible because, you know, you're, you're going for it and you go, no one's going to hear this, so I'll just go for it, you know, and you're, you're shredding away and the same with your singing, your ad-libbing, and you don't care if you miss a note or, you you know, you yeah. stuff up and you go in the wrong scale or whatever. You go, oh, I'll sort that out later. Yeah, yeah. So you, you are uninhibited. There's definitely that about it. Yeah. So what are you recording on? What What's your your setup? Because, like I said, that the, these days. Is, well, no, for the for the um oh, back the nineteen ninety sessions, yeah. Oh, right, okay. Um, so that was um an Akai twelve twelve MG twelve twelve was called. It was okay, a twelve yeah. track analog sort of mixing recording console, like a big chunky thing about a meter wide. Um, you know, like half a twenty four track basically. Yeah. Okay. So it was a big behemoth looking thing to have in your house, <laughs> and um, fantastic EQ on it. I've got to say, even to this day, people buy them just for the eq wow um i wish i'd kept mine because it was a great eq and um and it was quite an advanced machine its biggest achilles heel was the crap tape they used they used like um basically like vhs tape or beta cam real it was so it was thin like the tape itself was about an inch or three quarters of an inch thick uh, across but the thinness of the actual tape it was like half the thickness of um proper recording tape that you'd find in a studio. It was just like like hair thin. And so what would happen is as the heads would heat up from you rewinding and playing back and forwards, the tape would sort of, sort of deviate across the heads. And so you'd lose track one and 12 frequently. Oh, wow. It'd just phase in and out. Yep. Yeah, it had real problems. They did do some customizations later on where they used a proper tape and they recalibrated the bias for it to, to match, but um, I never got to that stage. So I was you know, regularly losing tracks one and, and 12. So I'd often just do 10 tracks and bounce back, you know, like that. So yeah. I used that. I had a bunch of outboard gear, old school, uh, you know, Yamaha SPX90 was fantastic. Yeah, had awesome. the best um, stereo harmonizer in it that you could just chuck on anything uh-huh. and make it sound better. Well, better for what we thought was better in the day, in the, in the 88 and to about 90. Um, I had this beautiful Alesis Quadroverb and that's, saturated that's what's all over my guitar solos oh, sometimes okay. i even i don't know if i've double tracked them or not i can't tell I, i'm right. thinking did i double track that line it sounds pretty kind of random like i just winged it and then i'm thinking i think it's the sbx on it harmonizing okay. it so it sounds massive stereo and then the quadra verb is just this fantastic delays with reverb on the delays so they just sort of cascade and so as you do a you know you'll hear it harmonize yeah yeah you know, you'll, you'll harmonise yeah. back on yourself. So, yeah, fantastic, things like that. So I had a bunch of roll and analogue delays. Um, and then, you know, I, I would have just recorded everything that way. I can't really remember what I had as far as microphones. I think I had a an old Sennheiser 420 um, that I had since I was a kid. Somebody gave it to me when I was a kid. And I think I used, you know, you used to use them on drums. But I think I sung into one of those. So, yeah, basic gear, basic gear. But it was, yeah. How are you tracking guitars? Because the guitars sound really um, very polished for, for much of the of the record. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I think I used um, a combination. I used um, Hughes and Kettner Cream Machine. Okay, it was yep. this was at the very early days of Sims. So, like, I probably pioneered one of the first Sims on a recording, which was the Rockman. Uh, the Rockman was designed as a practice little thing you belt, put on your belt loop and plug your guitar in, you could walk around the house with headphones on. And I decided that I'd just take that out and stick it straight in the console. <laughs> I used it on the first album, we'll talk about Park, right through it extensively. Um, but but on this one, I'd, I'd move forward a bit. I, I started getting sick of the little kind of compressed honky sound of the Rockman and I wanted something a bit more meaty. And this somebody tipped me off about the Hughes and Kettner cream machine and it was fantastic. It was the biggest sort of sim, you know, that sounded like an amp that I had ever heard. So I used that with a combination of, um, I think I had a Boss, I can't even remember what it's called now, something 6, um, GT6 maybe. Um, that was also a sim, pretty terrible sim, but it had some quirky effects and that would be some of the solos you could hear. I've got a fifth in there. There's a slight harmonised fifth. So I would have had, you know, like a bit like um, – on Owner of a Lonely Heart, the guitar solo on that. Yeah. You can, you can, it's a cool sound. 
even though you're fifth, staying right. fifth, and it's occasionally in the wrong wrong note when you hit a B or something, you know, it goes to the, you know, it doesn't go to the F yes, sharp, yes. it goes down to the F. So it's a bit weird. <laughs> but it's, you only have it in there just a little bit in the, in the blend, and it's enough to make it sound huge. And then occasionally I do use an octave or something like that. But that would be probably the GD, uh, GD6. But, um, okay. yeah, so mainly the Hughes and Kentner would have been the baby. Yeah, okay, yeah, because they sound great. And as you said, it was very early days for uh, cab sims and, yeah. and certainly no digital modelling. Yeah, and yeah. We're trying to do it. In and I would have always way, so. tracked the guitars. I would have, I think I always tracked the rhythm, so they're left and right, big stereo guitars, and then I'd do little yeah. sort of feature bits that might be in the middle. Um, solos were generally in the middle but sort of stereo imaged out to the sides. Okay, yeah, nice. Yeah, a song like um, Destiny's got those really fat double track yeah. rhythm guitars each side. <laughs> Massive, <That's> yeah. <laughs> if only I could sing it in that key now. <laughs> because, you know, that's <laughs> often the, the poison with a guitar is, you know, you think guitar riffs, as you know, you know, you can only move them so far. And especially if they're yep. polyphonic riff, we're using a couple of notes. You can only move them a few tones either way, and then it ends up it's another riff. And it can sound terrible on the neck, you know, if you're playing too far down or too high up. And that's one of those sure. riffs. Yep. I, I sing about a fifth lower than I sung on that record. So, um, okay. yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a dilemma when I go, well, how am I doing this riff now? You know, you can you change the inversions around, you change this. I, probably I, when we eventually do it live, I'll do a combination of synths layering my guitar to get the sort of right, because it's going to be either too low or too high either way you look at it. But um, Right, right, yep. yeah. Yeah, usually in a live situation, no one knows. It's not like you go, hang on a minute. That's in a different key. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go back a little a little bit earlier. You mentioned Funky Town, and I, I know probably everyone wants to talk to you about this, but I've got to say my experience with Funky Town is very guitar centric and personal. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. So 86 Funky Town comes out. I've been playing guitar for about three or four years, loving it. I've had an electric guitar for about one year. Had this yeah, weird cool. sack eye, which I think I think I've seen a picture sack of you. With oh my sm- god, the yeah. sack eye! Yeah, I had. Um, Did you have a what, sack eye? Yeah, it wasn't actually mine. It was one of my uh, older brother's friends, and he used to lend it to me regularly. Okay. Dear guy, he was. He was so cool. He used to. Oh, I'd walk about a kilometre to his house. No, just hope he was home. And if he's home, I'd say, "Hey, can I borrow the guitar?" And he'd go, "Sure thing, buddy." Awesome. And he'd give me this. It was a white S- SG, and um, I have such yeah. fond memories about that. One day I'll buy one again just for the, the nostalgia to hang on the wall, you know. For the vibe. Yeah, great yeah, that's memories so cool. with the SG. Yeah. My electric was the first. Was the same one, but the sunburst one. So oh, anyway, beautiful. anyway, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Banging around on that. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was the best thing ever until I hear Funky Town, and then there's you with a Floyd Rose. Oh yeah. A couple of yeah. things. Number one. Yeah. I thought, is this this is the pseudo Weko guy? This guy rips. What a, what's going on? Um, which was more which was more my ignorance than anything you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, no, understandable. Yeah, understandable because I never really featured on guitar in pseudo. So it was a purpose thing that I did in the eighties, the early part of the eighties. Guitar was taboo. Nobody did guitar solos. You know, it was all chorus and JC one twenties and you know crap like that. So you just had to go with it. You know. Well, yeah, true. But that said, when I went back to listen to um, the first couple of records, even mm. um, there's there's a beat for you. There's yeah, some, yeah. some really great guitar on there, and I just yeah. didn't even notice because it just yeah, it cool. wasn't obvious obvious enough for, for yeah. teenage me to, to yeah, understand. Yeah. But yeah, I sort of I sort of blended it in with the keyboards. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until yeah. really maybe even a little bit on Love and Adventure album. There's a few bits here and there, and then Funky Down. I just okay. said, right, I'm not going to mess around anymore. <laughs> I'm going to do the yeah. stuff I learned as a kid. And, and they were the whole solo Fantastic. one, Funky Down, is just based around pentatonic scale that I learned as a kid and little riffs, cliches and things I learned when I was about 15. Oh, man, it's killer. So I had to rush out. Well, I had to save up my money from the, the milk yeah. run or whatever I was doing, uh, but I had to get a guitar <laughs> with a whammy bar. It wasn't Eddie Van Halen. It wasn't Steve Vai. It was Brian Cannon from uh, Pseudo cool. Echo. Thank you. Thank you. So well, thank yeah. you. They were a great invention, weren't they? Because prior to that, you know, I was always emulating Jimi Hendrix when I was a kid and he used to do the most amazing uh-huh. dive bombs. I don't know how the hell he kept playing after those dive bombs. I think he just, I think what he did is when you dive bomb, the most thing that happens is that the, the tension on the machine head pulls the string sharp 
as you dive bomb it down, it goes over the nut towards the machine head. And when you let go, it's going to be a little bit higher, just a, a, a tad. And I think what those kind of guys do is they just club the cord and pull it back into tune with their fingers. And, and you know, uh-huh. it's going to be pretty vague, but within reason, you know, you hear him do um, Foxy Lady and he plays that wacky chord he always does that he's famous for, the kind of minor major. Yes. And as he hits it, you can hear him go, dong, dong, and he sort of pulls it down with his fingers to, to get it back in tune. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's the coolest technique. But, yeah, the Floyd Rose sorted yeah. that right out. <laughs> what an invention. What a great invention. I hope you are enjoying today's interview. Now, this podcast is brought to you by The Pedal Movie, a feature-length film all about effects pedals created by the music gear Mark Place Reverb. Now, you know we love guitar pedals here on the Guitar Speak podcast, and we're super excited on the release of this film. The Pedal Movie explores how effects pedals and their builders have shaped modern music and guitar playing over time, from the fuzz pedal experiments of the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix, through the shoegaze and indie rock of the 90s, and up to the modern day use of effects. Reverb also speaks with builders and leaders from more than 50 pedal brands to answer the big question, how did guitar pedals get so big? Reverb's The Pedal Movie is available now on iTunes, Google Play and Voodoo. For more info, check out thepedalmovie.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by master guitar teacher Joe Elliott. Now, I was a beta tester for the course, and as a music educator myself, I was very impressed by the logical layout and format of the course. Heavyweight guitarists such as Brett Garsett and Greg Koch have also endorsed the program, so check it out at www.fretboardbiology.com. Okay, back to our interview. What were you listening to when you said 15, 16 and you're bringing those guitar ideas back? What, what was inspiring you? Well, the main guitarists that I would have aspired to, to play like or, or, or to, to be would have been Jimi Hendrix, number one, Jimmy Page, number two, Richie Blackmore um, from Deep uh-huh. Purple. Um, and then moving on a little bit, I discovered this crazy band called Styx, an American stadium rock band. And yeah, uh, yeah. two guitar players, great guitar players, very underrated, Tommy Shaw and James Young, um, great players. And, and I was fortunate enough to see them while I was travelling through the States recently and it was such a buzz, you know, see Tommy Shaw, you know, just shredding it on the guitar. He's such a great guitarist. And then I saw Don Felder too, like um, from the Eagles doing all those songs. And that was just, he's such a great guitarist. His bends are pitch perfect. He never, he never just misses one bend, anything. His technique is just second to none. And um, so those sort of guitarists, the Eagles, all of those, um, Joe Walsh and players like that would have been my biggest influence. And then I had, on the other side, I had, a complete contrast because my mum and dad were into really sort of Brazilian hipster music. They liked uh, Sergio Mendes and all this stuff like that. So I, I was fortunate enough to have great insight to um, uh, Puerto Rican guitarist um, Jose Feliciano, and I love Jose's playing, and, he, and he's such an unrated wow. vocalist as well. He's a fantastic singer, but his guitar chops are outrageous, and the guy's blind from birth. He just plays mm. from the soul, you know, so... I loved the way, you know, he only mainly played uh, nylon um, and in that style, but I just really got into his his whole feel and things like that. I never really could do it on a nylon. I'd, I'd interpret it on an electric. But, um, sure. yeah, they were they were all influences. So it's, a, it's a quite a diverse. Even Benson, I was very influenced by George Benson. Um, they're all, you know, varied guitarists. So I think it's, it's good when you have a, a broad influence and then moving on Eddie Van Halen of course was a huge influence later on so yeah all all of those sort of you know early late 70s and and just tipping into the 80s that's very cool that's that's awesome it's interesting looking back as well and again when I said you know I was listening to the earlier albums um in I mean the 80s was such a fertile time for all sorts of music but as as a listener it took a while throughout the 80s for for people to differentiate so for me growing up as a headbanger I was yeah. listening to a lot of new wave or, mm. or new romantic stuff which now I love and appreciate yeah, and I can yeah, hear all right. these like I said the really cool guitar parts yeah that, yeah, that cool. you guys were writing 
Yeah. Um, yep. When when you're doing those first records, what are you drawing on there for the electronic side of things, and plus the still adding cool guitars? Yeah, because as I said, I sort of almost had to retire all my seventies chops I learned as a kid, and I could hear this new sound in the eighties. So when when I started doing listening a beat for you, those songs, I, I realised I, I couldn't do all those sort of licks that I'd grown up with because they were starting to sound a bit out of fashion. They're sounding a bit old fashioned, you know. Um, and so I was listening to, then I started listening to Simple Minds, Charles Birchall, and I'm thinking, oh, this guy's got to get on. There's no shredding, no nothing. It's all, it's all echoes and sort of twangly choruses. And un- I really dug the unusualness of it. And no bends. He never bent a note. He never sustained a note. It was yep. just all little bits and pieces. Um, uh, Andy Taylor from Duran Duran, he, he's a bit of a rock and roll Andy. I could hear... On the recordings, he's, he's disciplined and he's, they must have told him, hey, no shredding. And you can hear he's just playing octave riffs. Much Probably yeah. one of the big influences of me. I know when I saw Duran Duran live in 82, I could tell that Andy was a rockhead. You know, he's, he was right. just sneaking right. in little pentatonic licks, you know, flicking through them. And I said, ah, hang on, he's a rock and roller. So <laughs> that was kind of reassuring in a way because then I was, well, at yeah, least it's not nice. completely uncool. Um but, yeah, um, same with the Kemps in um, Spandau Ballet. I loved what they were doing. Um, so, yeah, I think I just drew from that and then just I could see and one of the big ones, the, probably the biggest influence on my 80s guitar playing was mid from Ultravox because oh, when yeah. I discovered Ultravox, I listened to the way he was playing the chords. That was the biggest thing. I said, this guy's not playing power chords. He just bangs across the six strings as though it's like an acoustic almost and he doesn't overly distort it too much. He just kind of puts enough in there so you can hear that it's six strings or five strings that he's connecting with and he just like this, you know, he, he you can hear it a lot on um, the B-side to listening, which is on the, the new version of Autumnal Park called uh, In Their Time. And that has very much the uh, mid Ultravox flavour and, and, you know, unabashedly too. I mean, you know, I, I idolised his playing. I remember seeing them live and I just really watched what he was doing. He was playing through an AC30 box, so um, okay. a bit of a different style to me, the sound-wise, But I st- and that's what, how it should be. I don't think you should ever listen to one guitarist too much and focus too much on everything they do because you'll just sound like a, a watered-down version of them. So probably is better to have lots of influences and kind of mix it up. But, yeah, those sure. guys would have been where it came from. And then, you know, all the jangly, discordant arpeggios I'd play or things like that, all from that that um, early 80s. Yeah, cool. Very cool. What were you playing at the time in terms of guitar and amps effects? Um, How were you crafting those tones? Okay, when I started with Suits, I had uh, probably because I'd seen Simple Minds and I knew Charles Birchall, he was running two JC-120s. It's a bloody cardinal sin of guitar if you think about it because those things are just they are a shocker. I mean, they've got a sound, you know, they have a sound, but, geez, you wouldn't want to play rock through yeah. them. I think they just have this yeah. volume and then one knob that says distortion, I think, and it's the worst distortion. But um, <laughs> So he had two of those, and I remember hearing his sound. Yeah. so cool. So what I did is I, um, I had a Yamaha G112, um, it's, oh, yeah, 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 yeah that. they're, they're not a bad amp. Like you can get for that sound, you know, for that non-rock sound, but kind of still with a bit yep. of guts. Because had to dry at least you could yeah. drive it. You could had a preamp, and um, so I used that. And then I got two of them, and I got two, and then I ran one of those Boss stereo choruses between the two, yep. and I would set them up. Strangely, I'd set them up in front of me on stage, next to the wedges, left and right. Okay, so they just directly could feed back to the guitar, and I could hear it like when you play facing an amp rather than you're back to it. Yeah. Yeah, I liked the yeah, sound cool. of it coming at me that way rather than behind me. So, um, yeah, I ran them and then I had a bunch of pedals. I think I ran a – they were nearly all Boss, I think, because that was the latest pedal with the FET switch. I remember uh, they didn't have the click, you know, they just this little silent FET switching yes, when you right. engage it. That was, yeah. a, that was a real new thing, you know, so – and a nice rubber grippy sort of pedal, you know, it was uh, nice and tactile to stand on. So I had yep. um, I, I I moved them around a bit. I had an analog delay, AD. Oh, I can't remember what it's called, but you know the sort of Maroni purpley looking pedal. Yeah, the very yep. first one. Yep. I had one of those, 
and I had that right up till just recently. I gave it to somebody, I think. Yeah, I gave it to one of my mates. So, okay. you know, it was still kicking, but it had fallen apart, you know, like the springs break and they just – but uh, they were very robust. So I had one of those. I had a, a thing called a vibrato pedal. I think it was tremolo pedal. It was the weirdest pedal. What it was supposed mm-hmm. to simulate was the, the whammy, you know, like a Bigsby, you know, when you do that real soft trim. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you just yep. sort of vibrato on not you know, the way the tremolos were designed to be for the tramp rather than dive bombs. And so this pedal yes. did that. Yep. Kind, it was kind of weird. It was it was strange. It was basically like half a chorus pedal. So you're not getting yeah, yeah, yeah. an oscillator spin two, one straight and one chorusing. You're getting one signal LFO on the on the, on the whole sound. So it's a bit bizarre. So not almost like tape the going whole wrong. Thing is, yeah, the whole thing is going yeah, yeah. like this up and down, yeah. like a sort of a weird sine wave. It was bizarre. But it was the 80s. God, you can hear it on many 80s records. You know, whenever yeah. you hear a, a jangly chord plucked like an arpeggio, it was classic yeah. for that because it sounded almost like the tape was wowing, you know, like a bit of uh, tape wow and flutter like that. That was good. Uh yeah. I didn't have a wah because wahs were taboo. They were just kind of out yep. in the 80s. So <laughs> I probably had one, but I didn't use it with suits. But, yeah, it was fairly minimal. It was minimal. I just reckon I had a I had an OD1 or an OD2 Boss Overdrive. Okay, yep, yep. You know, you've got to have an overdrive just to take you up a level and a bit more sustain and, you know. And, and to this day I still always will have some form of massively overdriven distortion because I – as a kid, I learned to play with a distortion pedal, which they say is a really bad idea to do. I learned off just backyard players, you know, kids who are a couple of years older than me. And then one day I went to a kind of a formal jazz player and he was fantastic. And he did teach me a lot, although I wasn't a good student. You know, he'd be trying to teach me how to play proper chords and how to mute this and do that. And I do remember a few of the more senior guitar players when and it was sort of early 70s and they were saying, uh, look, don't use that distortion pedal when you're practicing. You know, it's going to make you sloppy, and you, you're not going to hear what you're really doing. And and I'd bought this distortion pedal by a company called Corin, and it was a little little orange box. I've still got it somewhere, and um, it was just I couldn't believe the sound that, that you know, like when you played in the seventies, and most of them didn't have didn't have a game; they just had volume. So the only distortion you yeah. got was by turning it up to bloody 11 and making your speakers, you know, just freak out. And so by that stage, yeah. the, whole neighbor, the whole neighbourhood knew you were playing your guitar. So it was so loud. So when I got the distortion <laughs> pedal, finally I had some, you know, like proper drive and I loved awesome. it. The thing would just awesome. be just, it would go off. So I always had this pedal over, way too overdriven. So if you stood on it and you weren't holding the guitar, the strings, it would just... Whistle, go, go <laughs> mental. And, and to this day, that's how my sound is. Whenever I play a solo, and if I let go of those strings, it's not going to be good. So you just got to have that technique. And so what I was Perfect. getting to is, uh, ironically, because I did the bad, bad practice with the distortion, I became the master of the bloody distortion pedal instead of the master of clean, clean, muted style. <laughs> I just got really good at knowing how to control the distortion. And um, so well, it was that's, a, that's it was, an art in itself. Yeah, sure. it was. It was a fluke, really. It was just from bad, bad you know, habits, but I actually became very good at controlling the distortion. And uh, so, yeah, I, th- so that was kind of my setup. I would have had those those fundamental pedals, um, you know, chorus, echo, and uh, and drive, and that would have pretty much been it, three or four pedals. All right, guitar, nothing good, no, nothing crazy here. They were just crappy, cheap <laughs> Ibanezes. Um I, I did have my beautiful Ibanez artist, the black one that I had featured on Facebook recently with the story about it. I saw that. That Amazing. is just a yeah. beautiful guitar. Yeah. <laughs> that is so gorgeous. But it weighs an absolute ton, so it wasn't much fun on stage. You couldn't wheel the guitar around and do all fancy moves and, you know, it was just it was just too heavy. So I opted for a few strats and things like that. But when I started Pseudos, I bought the Ibanez Blazer. Uh, I think it was maybe called like a Roadster or Road Series or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That kind yeah, I remember of those. kind sure. of ugly but really kind of cool. quirky. Yeah. So I had a blue yeah. candy blue and a candy apple red, and you know, so okay. just it's just for my AB guitars, and um, that was basically a Strat, you know, single coil, three single coil pickups with a five position switch, maple necks. No, they were sort of a quality guitar at least. You know, they stayed in tune. They were harmonically pretty well well balanced, and so I used those for the first 12 months until, you know, we had a hit and then I bought a Fender. 
And then I bought the nice. Fender Elite Stratocaster, the one with the press press buttons for the pickups. Ah, the three buttons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so they were that was that was a nice step up, you know, when I went to that. And it had active pickups, it had those uh lace sensor, the smooth pickups where you don't see the magnets. They're yes. pretty unusual. Yeah. They're pretty rare. You don't see many of them around. I, I, you know, the one you said you had hanging on the wall there behind you. Um, yeah. It, it was that colour combo, but yeah, it was less sexy than that because they had that sort of nerdy flat pickups. But a bit, you know, yeah. it was a thing. It was a thing of the eighties because you got to remember anything that was a new invention in the eighties was considered, you know, avant-garde, state of the art. So that, and that's what the eighties were all yeah. about. It's all about having, you know, yeah. something futuristic rather than traditional. So, um, sure. yeah, when I had that. Fender Strat being the elite model, it was kind of cool. Um, that everyone was saying, oh, wow, look, it's, it's all smooth and you can't see the magnets on the pickups and had buttons. And the buttons are great in theory, but they're for playing live because if you want to go from the bridge to the neck in one move, exactly. you've, got to, you've got to turn it off <laughs> and then turn the other one on. And, and that's why yeah. probably, I think in the Funky Town video, you can see there's a, a mod switch on my Strat that's got a little like a little phase switch kind of thing, one of those little silver little tiny toggles with two, two position um, on one part of it, and then it's got a toggle switch somewhere else. I can't even remember where it is, but it's got a three-way toggle. So what that did is the little silver switch switched between the, the press buttons, it deactivated those, and it switched in a traditional tri-switch like a Les Paul. So I oh, could just oh, go okay. neck, bang, bridge, you know, in one hit. Yeah, because it, yeah. it was just ridiculous trying to muck around with those press buttons, you know. So they were sure. good to get certain yeah. combos, though. You could get nice combos. You get a nice combo that I used a lot when I recorded was the neck and the bridge together. You know, almost okay. like a telly sort of vibe. Yeah, it was it was telly. a nice sound. Yeah, yeah. Nice. that is cool. Mm. The only other person I knew who owned uh, one of those elite uh, was a fantastic Sydney guitarist called David Holmes, and I know he put a five way in his yeah in new scratch plate. Yeah, you'd have to. Yeah, they were just a pain. They were great in the way. studio, but no good live. Sure, sure. So that was the Funky Town video guitar. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Awesome. So as you and I were saying before, before I hit record, yeah. um, we're zooming for the listeners at, at home listening. Um, and yeah, my my main strat's a sort of like a sixties style with mm. a few modern work, but it's a, it's a vintage white. Yeah, uh, beautiful rosewood board, and um, yeah, yeah, I love that. And I was just saying to Brian, yeah, I think subconsciously. Funky Town embedded like strat <laughs> yeah. into my head. Yeah, it's a bit and synonymous. Heart. Yeah, that's awesome. And what was that the guitar you used on that record? Yeah, I did. I used. Um, I think I used two guitars because I double tracked everything on that record. So I okay. used uh, the Strat straight in a console, massive compression and widening to do the bam ba a little signature minor seventh chord for oh, the choruses. Yeah. 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 That's one of those chords that I was saying when you move it around too much, it takes on a new personality because in the original version of Funky Town, it's a C minor seven, smack bang in the middle of the fretboard. It's got such a beautiful bit of bang and that, you know, right there in the middle. It's just gorgeous. And because that's sung with a vocoder in the verses and then the choruses are all, you know, hello, doctor. They're right up in the clouds. It's chick. And um, so for me to do it, I had to shift it down a fifth too, a fifth and a bit. I, we moved it down to E. And so there I'm thinking, well, how the hell do you do that, That you know, uh, across the board E minor seven? You're either playing an open E minor seven, which that ain't going to work. Yeah. They'll sound like a country and western riff. Or then I had to move <laughs> all the way up to the 12th fret or, yep, or yep. do the, the second inversion on, on the fifth fret. It just it was nowhere to go. So I did it on the 12th fret because I wanted that shape where you, you don't play the fifth string, you just play the E string. Yes. And then the, and then the, yep, mi yep. the middle middle or the, you know, you play the, play the maybe the three strings left over or four strings left over and you play the E minor across two fingers I use to play it like that. And it's a nice way you can mute it and control it. Um, but it was a bit high. So I said, I've just got to get more out of it. So I really double tracked it put it right out to the sides and said, it's going to just go bang, like that, compress the crap out of it. So it just sits there. Um, that took care of that duty. And then I used, um, I had a hollow body Ibanez artist as well, Sunburst with the F-holes. I think, um, is it the Schofield type? And maybe it's a John Schofield model. It was pretty okay. fancy looking yeah, with cool. a bit of, you know, nice uh, mother of pearl and all that crap. And I had a Floyd Rose added to that too. Or it was probably a Kayla actually. Kayla was was the you know first off the mark for me, and then I went to Floyd Rose, same thing. And um, 
so I used that for all the big power chords and all the main heavy duty stuff. And then the solo, yeah. I think I used my Strat and the artist. I double tracked it. So oh, okay, okay, yeah, awesome. Because awesome. double track solo, you know, I, there's something about it. I think a lot of those yes. records you hear in the seventies, they're nearly all double tracked. That's how they get that sound. Yeah. You, know, you you do it single, you'll you'll hear your bends, you'll hear which is a beautiful sound in itself too when you're single solo, of course, but there's something about a double track solo, especially when it's elaborate and there's lots of riffs and, you know, if you listen to Dark Side of the Moon and you hear the solo on Money, my God, it is blazing and it's double tracked. <laughs> Holy crap, he must have spent yeah, forever, you know, picking out his riffs and go, what did I do there? You know, like, so I think I just yeah, did a yeah. solo and then kind of, I probably constructed bits of it, went for a wild solo added in a few cliches here and there, finally got it to a form that I liked and then went through it, picked it all out and double-tracked it. And, um, okay, yeah, okay. just blazing. I probably didn't pan it hard left and right, pulled it in a bit. But, but yeah, nonetheless, the tracking gives it the real whale. And, then, yeah, I think that's Strat and Artist together. Okay. Oh, man. I'll have to listen again because that, that solo's imprinted. <laughs> on my mind. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's been printed in my mind too, don't worry. I think I've been, you know, thinking about the grocery list sometimes when I'm doing that solo live and, you know, it's, it's, it just comes out on autopilot. <laughs> it's, it's great. I yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. I, I, moving it to E, though, perfect for a guitar player. Like yeah. you said, the original was in Beautiful C. Beautiful solo that's department E. Killer, you know, you've got all the dive yeah. bombs of the open E and you can play in the second fret, your pentatonic up there, or you can, you know, you, it's just it's so easy scale to solo on E. I love it. For sure. Rocking, man. That is so good. That is so cool. Hey, there's um, there's a black strat, a 76 strat that I, I see yeah, yeah. you with a lot as well. Tell me about that. Well, that's got a bit of a story. That was um, that belonged to a guy called Zoran Romich, who's um, passed away some years back. Now, Zoran uh, was the kind of a friend who was in the band Chocolate Starfish, and I produced most of their their early successful stuff, I guess, rather than the yeah, later stuff, yeah. all the early stuff. Um, so that was his guitar, and um, you know we used that extensively on the recordings of the first few albums of, with Starfish. And um, some years later, when I finally reformed Pseudo Echo, I'd sort of gotten rid of a lot of my guitars that had Floyd Roses. I, I just, you know, the sound had come and gone and then, you know, it was sort of not not the latest thing anymore and wasn't really something I needed to play anymore with um, that style. And I changed a bit so I didn't have any Floyd Rose guitars and all of a sudden gigs started coming in for Pseudos. I thought, shit, I need a Floyd Rose to do Funky Town and all that stuff. And um, yep. I remembered that Zorin had this beautiful vintage guitar that had been completely bastardised and sacrilegiously had a Floyd Rose hacked into it because I wouldn't do that in a fit, you know, but I said, well, it's already done, so, you know, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll do it in that case. And so Zorin just said, look, just use it, just grab it and use it for the tour, and I used it for the tour. And then we just kept touring. Gigs kept coming in and we kept touring, and then like three years had gone by, and um, I see Zorin one day and I say, um, do you uh, – do you want to sell me that guitar? Because it's like, you know, like I'm still using it. And, and then and he just said, just, yeah, sure. I think I gave him a thousand bucks. It was a steal. Wow. And, um, you know, I just used oh, it again for the, and then I had it for like 20 odd years. I still got it. I only just retired. So yeah, it's, it, that's okay. a beast of a guitar. It's the frets are so worn out that it's nearly fretless. They're fat, <laughs> wide frets, but not high. They're like, okay. okay. They're just like, they're about a millimetre off the fretboard. They're so low. So I got so used yeah. to playing that and um, mm -hmm. and I got used to having my fingers come in contact with the rosewood and that just became the way I played. It was It's a it's a challenge because every time you bend, you're just the friction across the fretboard and plus you've got yeah. the problem of the Floyd rose bending down when you bend up because the rose, the, yeah. the Floyd moves down every time. So you've got to bend probably twice the distance with the Floyd rose if you've got it set up fairly Good loose. Deal, yeah. Yeah, it's a Definitely. big, big effort to bend. And um, I used to use fairly heavy strings. Like I was probably using, you know, 42 to nine, uh, sorry, 48, 46 to nines, no, 10, 10 to 46, sorry. And now I use yep. 11 to 49. So I just keep getting okay. heavier. But I, I might may, may go yeah. back. You just, it's just a disciplinary thing because when you have those heavy strings, you get incredible sustain incredible power on your chords they just ring forever but then you got the you know the 
the hassle of when you're bending and soloing, it's like, you know, like playing a steel string acoustic. It's so heavy, you know. <laughs> there's a pay, there's a payoff there, you know. But um, sure. but yeah, so that thing, you know, that was set up with the six strings and you know, relatively low action, not not super low. Because I've always had sort of, so I just developed a technique with the slightly higher than most players would have it. Um, yeah, but that yeah, so that that was a beast of a guitar, and that's got um, EMG active pickups in it. So that was kind of closer to what my old elite had. So it was nice too. It was a nice, and I got used to that sound again and that sort of sensitivity in the pickups. And um, and it's got a humbucker in the bridge. So it's kind of got everything you need as a workhorse. You know, it's beautiful old, you know, timbers a million years old. It resonates beautifully and sustains. And so it was a, it's a fantastic workhorse as much as many people might look at it and go, oh, my God, sacrilege, you know, it's a 76 strap with a humbucker shoved in it and, a, you know, a Floyd Rose and a locking system up on her neck. And But, but yeah, it's a workhorse. Oh, man. For, like we're, we're, we're probably similar generations. It's a, it's a piece of art when I see a strap that's been hacked into in that way, <laughs> especially the 70s one. That was, that was all the rage by the 80s. Yeah. Grabbing- yeah, seventies and, and oh, they, they were cheap too, like seventies strats. You know, you could pick them up for a thousand you bucks. Pick them up, yeah, yeah. You know, definitely, they were great. Definitely. You know, um, yeah, yeah. Whose signature is on that top horn? Um, that was Zorin's signature. Yeah, the the oh, the guy wow. who owned it. Yeah, and eventually yep. it just wore off. Eventually, and um, uh-huh. I kind of just thought, well, if it's you know, it is what it is. The guitar is what it is. I don't need to redo his signature or lacquer it. I just let it go, and then I just said, look, you know. It's it's got the spirit in there, and that was all good. And you know, it's just kind of hangs on the wall these days. But um, I'll probably take it out on the road again with me, just as a security blanket. You know, cool. And these days, I'm seeing you rocking an Ibanez Pia. That's a, a new addition. Yeah, I, I've always thought of, I thought I wouldn't play a signature guitar because you know I might as well play my own signature guitar. But you know, Steve Vai, you can't argue with that. You know, he's up there with the best of them. Um, the guitar's fantastic, I've got to say, right out of the box. I, um, it was hard to get a hold of. There were none around, and I ended up getting it from the Netherlands, of all places, and they um, they set it up for me with the right strings and the right action alike and, and sent it over. And it, it just straight out of the box, it's a quality guitar. You know, it, it really is. The thing is wicked. It took me a few days getting used to it because the fretboard's 43 or 44 across at the nut rather than 42. Okay. It's a little, you know, you get a little yeah. bit more width across the neck and it's a little bit flatter and um, thinner in the, in that way, in the, in the, in the thickness of it. Um, so, yeah, when you're sort of playing a blues style where you angle your fingers more, it's a, it's a bit more unusual to play, whereas when you're doing shredding with, you know, um, running scales, uh, that's what it's fantastic for. And yeah. it just t- it's still taking me. I'm still not fully... Um, used to it, but uh, it's just such a good guitar. You know, the, the amazing thing about it is they don't have a Floyd Rose these days. They have their own Ibanez one, the Edge, Edge Two. It's got on it, the tremolo, and that thing is so precise. I swear, I tuned it when I got it, and I don't think I've tuned it again. And I've had it for like six months, and it just doesn't go out of tune. Even after a gig, I yeah, gave it such a hiding. Got it home the next day and played. That was perfectly in tune still. Just okay. doesn't move. It's that's incredible. Super yeah. And, you know, it's got that sort of all the combos of, of the sound you want, you know, with your, your humbuckers and your coil, single coils and, yeah, just yeah, a blazer. Cool, it's a, such a great sound. That's awesome. Brian, it's been so fun talking about all this stuff. Just, yeah, cool. just to wrap up, I guess, what's what's next? What's coming up next for you and for Pseudo Echo? Um, look, Pseudo's has got a few tours up the sleeve to do because, you know, we've been hovering around with these lockdowns and we haven't really done a yeah. tour yet. So we, we were meant to tour when we did the After Party album. We didn't really get to do that. And then then we released the 1990 album and then we did one show in Melbourne and then that was it and it was all locked down again. So we've just been told our Sydney show is looking like it's gone because that's that's on the day the lockdown gets lifted. So we can't do that. That's right. Yeah. And we're still juggling that, with the next yeah. bunch of shows too because half our band is in Sydney and if they can't get out of Sydney, well, we can't do those shows either. So okay. um we're just trying to work out, you know, we're, we're just hanging in there and we'll just keep moving. We're not going to cancel anything. We'll keep keep our word and we'll do the show we're eating to do these songs and do some bits and pieces. So there'll probably be a preliminary tour where we'll do a few little snippets of the new record and then there'll be a more substantial tour where I'm going to 
get the whip out and get the guys learning uh, the 1990 album and actually really perform it like that. But that's that's a big job. Yeah, right. We can't do it without rehearsing extensively. So um, sure. that might be uh, later in the year or whenever. Um, and then there's yeah. also a solo tour that I'm going to do because I'm going to do a solo album. And um, oh, that there's probably a, a hint of it on the After Party album. You can hear there's a flavour where I go. And also on the 1990 album you can hear it because, as I said, some of those songs were written as a solo project. Songs like Let Me Be, Children in the World, yep. um, they were more on the solo tip, um, but they were still under the umbrella of Pseudo Echo, so we put them out as that record because they were from that same session. But, yeah, the um, yeah, so a solo thing will be something I'll do, and, and that may work in a slightly smaller scale if we're sort of restricted with um, lockdowns and things like that. Okay. That sounds great. would love to hear a solo record on top of, uh, all the the new or the new old stuff, the new old stock that's uh, that you've just released. Sounds like a good time for you. You bet. Excellent. Well, Brian, thank you so much. It's been a great thrill talking to you about uh, your career and really getting nerdy on the guitars, which is uh, which is great fun. And again, teenage me will not believe that I was talking to you about your past on Funky Town. So thank you so much. <laughs> great, great. Well, uh, you know, guitarists and, can rejoice on the 1990 album because there's uh, no shortage of it on there. I think there's a solo on nearly yeah. every song. Yeah, and often two solos. So that's yeah, that's right. yeah, that's right. That's right. For the ones I didn't do, I did two on the others. Yeah, and thank you for that. That's killer. Yeah, cheers, cheers. Thanks so much, Brian. No worries. Pleasure. All right, there you go. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Now, this podcast was brought to you by The Pedal Movie, the feature-length film all about effects pedals created by Reverb. Reverb's The Pedal Movie is available now on iTunes, Google Play, and Vudu. For more information, visit thepedalmovie.com. The show was also brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by ex-head of guitar at GIT, Joe Elliott. Check out fretboardbiology.com for more information. Alrighty then, you have been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling, and as the legendary German rocker Michael Schenker once told me, Keep rocking, keep on rocking. Keep on rocking indeed. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Bye now.